Go ahead and grab a seat. <clears throat> Welcome, everybody. Good to have Griffin Richards in the house this morning, back from Rwanda after a few years. Great to see you this morning. Hey, this is Back to Church Sunday, so thanks for uh, jumping in with us. Some of you haven't been here for, uh, I don't know, two, three weeks, two, three months, two, three years. Some of you, maybe it's been a while. Uh, this is one of those, the doors are wide open. Uh, we're a church that says, no perfect people allowed. We're not taking attendance and uh, putting you on sin probation if you haven't been here in a week. So uh, we're just delighted that you uh, made a choice this morning to come and be part of this community as we seek God together and uh, open our hearts to him and allow him to touch and transform our lives. Hi, I'm John. I am one of the pastors here at Ocean Hills, and you and I, hey, we're a lot alike. Hi, I'm Lori, and I am the pastor of small groups, and you and I, we're a lot alike. Hi, I'm Cozy, and I am the Director of Early Childhood and Serve Team Ministries, and you and I, we're a lot alike. Hi, I'm Brian, Director of Elementary Ministries, and you and I, we're a lot alike. Hi, I'm Brad, director of our youth ministry, and you and I, we're a lot alike. Hi, I'm Casey, and I'm the director of worship ministries, and you and I, we're a lot alike. Let it go. John, and I'm the director of women's ministry. You and I are a lot alike. Hi, I'm John L., the executive pastor here, and you and I, we are a lot alike. It's fun to serve on the youth ministry or on the uh, Ocean Hill staff team. Let's give it up for our staff, huh? Sometimes when you make a video, you don't know if it's going to be funny or not, right? And uh, thanks to uh, our team who was willing to laugh at themselves. And, and maybe as I start this series on vision this morning, um, I can say in a very clear way, that this is not a staff-centered church. This is really about the staff being in it together with you. The word covenant, we're a covenant church. The word covenant means in it together. And that's really the, the, the heartbeat of our team and our staff is we feel like God has uh, released us to minister among you, to be one of you, to help you discover your God-given potential to, to fully follow Christ. And, uh, and so Together this year, we're hoping to walk with you, to encourage you, to be alongside. We want to inspire you, challenge you uh, to become the men and women that God wants you to be. But that video really is an intro to this morning's message. We are going to be walking through the next few weeks our mission and vision statement. If you have your program, you look on the inside there, it says, well, well, I already ripped mine off, but I know it by heart. It says that we exist to inspire and to encourage ordinary people to live extraordinary lives by becoming fully devoted followers of Christ and living a life of love. This morning, we're going to take a look at this idea of what does it mean to inspire and encourage ordinary people. That video, part of what we wanted to do was connect with you to say, we're a lot alike. 
We're ordinary people. Ordinary isn't a negative. It's just about being mainstream, kind of regular, thinking of ordinary. In fact, I just made a, a, a little list of ordinary people. You're ordinary if you identify with many of these things. Ordinary people shop at Trader Joe's. Ordinary people post flattering pictures on Facebook. Ordinary people drink coffee, not kombucha. What the heck? That's that nasty stuff at the bottom of the drink. How many of you drink that stuff, really? All right, you're not extraordinary. You're just out of the ordinary. <clears throat> ordinary people want to be known, loved, respected. They want to have friends who are loyal and trustworthy. Ordinary people... They have stress in their life, whether it be health, kids, money, work, friends. Ordinary people get frustrated and disillusioned with their husband, their wife, their kids, their church, their small group. That's ordinary. Ordinary people struggle, struggle with worry, with guilt, with addiction, with resentment. Ordinary people struggle with debt, with weight, with pain, with insecurity, with jealousy. Ordinary people deal with hurt feelings, getting enough sleep. Ordinary people have people in their life that drain them and others in their life that fill them up. Is that true? Is that true of you? Oh, I guess it's just me. Look at it. I'm looking at it. Is it true that you have people in your life that drain you and fill you up? Thank you. Okay, I'm connecting, or maybe I'm not. Ordinary people long for the absence of problems in their lives. Ordinary people are hard on themselves, thinking that we should live mistake-free lives. Ordinary people give 2.5% of their income away to charity. Ordinary people say that we exercise five days a week, but really we exercise once or twice a week. Can I get an amen? Okay. Ordinary people eat at CPK. Who here has not eaten at CPK? Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you've never, if you've never, now raise your hand if you're a college student and have never eaten at CPK. Samantha, get up here. I got a CPK card for you right here. Right here. Here you go. Come on. You take Rob out on a date and become ordinary like the rest of us. And then Cozy helped me. There, what about college students, ordinary college students? She gave me a few. They have at least two or three expired things in their refrigerator. An ordinary college student goes to bed after midnight each night. And an ordinary college student, they have more than one device that they've figured out how to sync with another device. <laughs> Go figure. So here's my question. What does that have to do with anything? So what? Why does this matter? If you have a Bible, turn it to Ephesians. It's in the New Testament, Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. And the scripture tells us that ordinary people, that's you and that's me, that our lives matter to God. That's what the scripture shouts to us. The creator of heaven and earth, the Bible says, that he cares about you, your life, your circumstances, your stress, your marriage, your kids, all of those things, your education, your friendships, they all matter to God. In fact, the Bible tells us that the reason God sent his son Jesus into the world was to reconnect us, that, that, that sin broke, it ruptured the relationship that, that God had with people. And he sent his son as that atoning sacrifice to bring us back to God, the scripture teaches us to reconcile us, to reconnect us spiritually back to God, that we can enjoy a relationship with him. In fact, God wants to use your ordinary life to make an extraordinary impact on the people around you and on this community and in this world. And that's what we're going to talk about. That's what we're going to look at in the scripture this morning. I believe that Paul wrote this letter to the church in Ephesus to inspire and encourage ordinary believers in the first century to discover their God-given potential. He cast a vision for them. And vision really has to do with being a bridge from the present to the future. And I love his prayer that you see here. Let me read it for us. You have it in your program as well if you did not bring a Bible with you. It's on the back. 
Paul says this, when I think of all of this, now you got to say, what, what is he talking about? What's this? If you just read the passages beforehand, he's talking about how great God is and who Jesus is, that, that he died for us. And he says, when I think about Christ and how magnificent he is, he says, I fall to my knees and I pray. When you take a deep look at who Jesus is, Paul says what it did for him the response was he fell to his knees in humility, in awe, in worship. And he, he reached out to God. He cried out to God. He says he prays to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. Verse 16, he says, I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. And then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots, they will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it's too great to understand fully. And then you'll be made complete. Then you will be made complete. You'll discover your God-given potential. You'll be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. And then verse 20. And now all glory to God, who's able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. God has a dream for your life. He has a dream for my life. He has a dream for this church. That's part of what we want to figure out together as we are in community and small groups, as we walk together in mentoring, discipleship, relationships. Who is it that God has made me to be? What's the kind of person that he wants me to become? How shall I then live once I figure out who God is? And this morning in this text, there, there are two words. You see them that they're, they're, they're highlighted in your program. It's the word power and the word love. I think those are the two X factors for living an extraordinary life. Those are the X factors that I want to look at this morning. I think the, the two things that we need to know, number one, is it possible? Is it possible to live in a new way? Is it possible to love in a supernatural way? Is it possible to love people in your life that are unlovable at times? Is it possible to be transformed from being a taker to becoming a giver? To, from becoming a person who uses other people to becoming a person who might serve other people? And so this morning I want us to look at that. Number one, the two X factors. One, we need to know it's possible. Verse 16, Paul reminds us that God's resources, you might want to circle this phrase, his unlimited resources. What does that mean, unlimited resources? There is no end to the possibilities, to the depths of God's power. The word power that's used over and over again, it means the ability and the capability, the ability and the capability of acting, of behaving the way that God wants you to act and behave to live and to love like Jesus Christ. That's what it means. God gives us the power to live in a brand new way. Look at verse 20. It tells us that God is able. He is able. He's able to do what? He's able through his mighty power at work within us. What does that mean? God has taken his spirit and he puts his spirit inside a believer and he says, now you are able because I'm able, I'm going to give you my power. I'm going to put my power within you. That's what he says. To accomplish infinitely more. You might look at your life and you might go, oh, I, I can't do it. My life's hopeless. I've always been this way. My personality is just that way. I've always been selfish. I've always been this way. And God sees you and he sees who you can become. And he says, I want to give you the gift of my Holy Spirit. And I want to place that spirit in you that will give you the capacity to live at a level 
that you've never, never experienced before. I can do something so great in your life if you'll allow me to put my spirit in you. And that's what he says. God's power gives us both the capacity and the capability. Did you know that? The capacity and the capability to live and to love like Jesus. And so is it possible to live a new life? than the one you're living right now, those roommates that are already bugging you after one week? Is it possible to think about, wow, God is going to give me the power. God, God is going to empower me so that I can love the people in my life that are really annoying, really challenging, really difficult. God's going to give me the ability to see how I can live an extraordinary life by living beyond myself rather than living for myself. He's going to give me the time He's going to give me the energy. He's going to give me the desire to serve other people rather than just standing around going, serve me, serve me, serve me. Extraordinary life. We need his power. I, I, I was thinking of a story that happened pre-drought. Let me just go on the record. This is pre-drought story. So I don't want any nasty emails about me watering uh, my flower pots during the drought. I didn't do that. I didn't do that. But I want to say, gosh, maybe a year ago, Natalie, every once in a while, will say, hey, could, could you just water the pots? And so, of course, I go, I turn on the hose, and I start watering the pots, and I'm watering, I'm watering, and, and I'm watering over here and over here. And, of course, you know, the hose, I'm stretching it, and all of a sudden, the power gets cut off. There's no more flow of water. How many of you have had that experience? There's a kink in the hose, right? And so, what do you do? If you're like me, you, you shake it. You try and shake it out. Come on, come on, come on. And I've just found in this, in this, case, this, in this story, I'm telling you, it didn't, it didn't work. So what did I have to do? I had to walk back over here, and I had to go, oh, doggone it. Look at it. This is where the kink is. And I had to take the kink out of the, ho out of the hose. And what happened when I went over here, took the time, took the energy, focused just for a moment, said, i got to get this right, got rid of the kink, then the water flowed again. The flow was there. The power was there. Think about your life right now. God's power wants to flow in and through your life. But so many of us, we have a kink in our life, in our hose. And that kink is sin in our life. It's willfulness. It's selfishness. The Bible says that sin blocks our relationship with God. It cuts off his flow, his power. And so, Part of our job is not to just go, oh, I hope I could just kind of shake it out. No, our job as followers of Jesus is we've got to come back to God and we have to confess the kink. We have to say, yeah, look it, I'm part of the reason why I'm not able to live the way that you want me to live. That your power is not flowing through my life because I've made some decisions. I've acted in certain ways and it's, it's blocking, it's cutting off the flow and the power of God and his ability to, to live and act through me and love people through me. And so we have to confess our sin. That's part of the spiritual journey. I want to ask you a question this morning. I wrote it here in my notes. It's what is that, that kink in your life that's blocking the flow, that's stopping the flow of God's power? Is it an angry temper flare-up? Maybe it's an intentional lie, a fabricated story to cover up a deceitful life. Maybe it's an unkind word, a sharp little something you said to your kids or your wife or your roommate on the way here to church. Maybe it's a hard-hearted response to people in need. You've just become compassion fatigued and you've, you've shut off your ability to respond with compassion. Maybe it's a peek at pornography that you're just going to take a little, it's not going to hurt me. And it blocks the flow of God's power. Sin blocks the flow. I want you to hear that this morning. And we can't just shake that problem out. We must stop and deal with it through confession. And you're going to have a chance to do that this morning at the Lord's table before we come. To just get right with God. To deal with the kink in your life that says, wow, I'm going to acknowledge it. I'm going to confess it because I want that flow back in my life. That's going to give me the capacity and the ability to live in a whole new way. 
So here's the second X factor. The first is his power. It is possible to live in a new way. The second is we need to know that we're loved. That word love is mentioned over and over again. You know this, but let me remind us. If a person grows up without love, it cripples their life, doesn't it? Imagine you as a baby, neglected, never held. Imagine a, a person grows up and they're abused by their parents verbally, emotionally, physically, sexually. Those things happen to ordinary people, by the way. And, and, and it cripples us, it scars us, it hurts us. And something happens in us that we are not capable or able to live and to love the way that God designed us to live and love. We need to know that we are valued. We need to know that we are loved. And God did not leave it to chance for us to do that. He sent his son to die on the cross. He says, I don't want there to be any doubt whether or not you're valuable, whether or not you're a one-of-a-kind, priceless, original. I want you to know without a shadow of a doubt that you are my cherished possession. You're invaluable. I love you. And that's why he sent Jesus to die on that cross. Now, I've just explained that to you. But there's a difference between being able to explain love and experience love. Is there not? I can explain what love's like, and you kind of go, oh, yeah, whatever. But when you experience love firsthand, it touches you. You see it. You experience it. You feel it. It will transform your life. It will change who you are and who you become. To experience it rather than explain it is a big difference. I experienced love this week. How many of you are into fantasy football? Come on. How many of you have more than one team? Okay. I don't have more than one team. I got one team. But Wednesday night was our fantasy football draft. We were going to head over to my sister's house, Draft Central. We are going to have, you know, food, and we are going to have the computer, and we are going to figure it all out. And Alan Anderson, many of you know Alan. Alan and my sister and I, and then we are on a conference call with my dad and my brother. We make this one team up, and we have for years and years. So draft night's a big, fun, whatever. We get to my sister's, and somehow... The computer, it's not working. It's like, oh my God, what are we going to do? Now, I've told my wife, Natalie, that she's going to have a quiet night alone, peaceful. I am going to be out. Just enjoy your evening. Well, it's like, what are we going to do, man? We've we got to go somewhere. Let's go to my house. We'll just go to my house. So we come barging into our house. We get the computer set up. We get my dad and my brother on conference call. And the Irelands, we're just loud talkers. I mean, we just are, some people call us the loud family, so, <clears throat> including my wife. But um, we are a loud family, so we're talking draft, and we're, we're just blah, 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 blah. But as we come in, I, I go into the back room, and I go, Natalie, I am so sorry. I go, it wasn't, it wasn't intended to be this way tonight. I promise you. We were supposed to be at my sister's. It didn't work out, but you know, could I just get a little mercy here tonight? Is that cool? And she was so gracious. She said, that's fine. That's cool. It's all good. I'll be in the back room. You guys out there, enjoy yourselves. Well, then 15 minutes later, she disappears. We see her walk through the front door. She comes back. Next thing I know, she comes out. She serves us drinks. A few minutes later, she's made us dinner, serves us dessert. I'm going, are you kidding? Now, I can explain that to you, but when you're on the receiving end of that, that grace, that love, that thoughtfulness, that kindness, that generosity, that's love. And when you've experienced it, when you see it, when you feel it, you know it. And that's what our dream is for you this year, that you would not just be able to explain God's love. We want you to experience it. We want you to know him intimately, personally, to have a relationship of love with him. And that's what Paul is talking about in this passage. He wants you to experience this love that, did you, did you notice his language? It's beyond understanding. Look at verse 17. It says that God wants to take up permanent residence in your heart. He wants to make his home in your heart. Some of you didn't know that. The God of creation wants to make his home. Why? Because he wants to be near you. He wants you to know that you're loved. He doesn't want to be disconnected from you. He wants to be close, intimately involved in every 
aspect in every corner of your life. His love, this love I'm talking about, that I'm explaining, that I want you to experience, it's just so complete. Look at how Paul describes it in verse 18. It's wide, it's long, it's high, it's deep. Wide. The love of God is wide. What does that mean? It's broad enough to reach out to every person on the planet. That's what that means. Jew and Gentile, male and female, rich and poor, young and old, gay and straight, every person on the planet, God says, my love is wide enough for you. Paul says his love is long. What does that mean? It means it continues the length of our lives. It never runs out. It even runs ahead. Are you familiar with that phrase, prevenient grace? It's grace that runs ahead of us. God provides. He protects. He knows what's out in front of us. And that love is running ahead. That's what it means that God's love is long. There's nothing that you can do or I can do to make God love you less. His love never runs out. It's unfailing. What about it's high? It's high. It means it rises to the heights of our celebrations, our achievements. His love is there to affirm us and and, and, and to say, well done, good and faithful servant. And then it's deep. This love that is hard to comprehend and understand, Paul says, this is a love that is so deep that it reaches down into the depths of ordinary people who are discouraged, who are demoralized, who are burned out and drained and fatigued. This love grows and digs down deep where it can touch those dark places in your life. And then verse 19, just zero in on this for one moment. Paul says, may you, what's the word? Look at, look at your notes. Look at your program. What's it say? May you what? Experience. Experience what? The love of Christ. Not may you explain it. May you experience it. That's Paul's prayer for me, for you, for this church. May you experience the love of Christ, though it is it's too great to understand fully. It's hard to wrap our arms around it, to make sense of it. It's one of those aha, mysterious experiences. You know it when you experience it, when it touches you. He, by his love, will absolutely transform your heart and your life. And then here's what happens. It says, verse 19, this love makes us complete with all the life and power that comes from God. In the NIV, it says that we would be filled with all the fullness of God. What does that mean? It means to be filled with all those gifts and graces that we see in Jesus Christ. It means that we would have our whole being filled with Christ-like fruit and qualities, compassion and gentleness, goodness and kindness, joy and love, justice and strength, mercy and truth. Now just stop for a second and think about that. Reflect on that. Think about being part of a family of people who begin to live this way and love this way, who begin to live in an extraordinary way. That's extraordinary. Living like Jesus is extraordinary. And the vision is The future begins to look more like this. We give more and we take less. We sacrifice more and we complain less. We serve more and we spectate less. We listen more and we talk less. We pray more and we judge others less. It means we choose transparency over hypocrisy. It means we choose forgiveness over bitterness and resentment. It means we will bear with each other rather than give up on each other. It means we will be devoted to building others up instead of tearing others down. And it means that we're willing to lean in to make this community a life-giving and a life-changing community. That's really the dream that we have, that God's put into our heart. All of this is about for his glory, and that's verse 21. 
To him be glory. It's all about seeing God glorified. And when the church becomes a life-giving community and a life-changing community, God is the one who gets the glory. Do you understand life-giving and life-changing? Life-giving is we are feeling like life is being breathed into us. Our tank is being filled up when we spend time with God and each other rather than we're being depleted and drained. And we say this often here, Jesus is the life giver, and he wants the church to be a life-giving community. So when you come, your spiritual tank, your emotional tank, your relational tank is filled up. That's our dream for you. And life-changing is about when you leave here, you're different than when you came in, because you're part of a community that, that celebrates you. It's, you're part of a community that loves you, that forgives you, that tolerates you, that bears with you. And you help make that community. It's a life-giving and a life-changing community. That's our heart and that's our dream. And I'm supposed to be done at 11 o'clock and it's 10.59. So let's close in prayer. Take a moment to prepare your heart for this table. Take a moment to confess the kinks in your life. Just to get right. It's not about earning, but it's about asking for forgiveness. Coming clean. Letting God shine his spotlight into every corner of your heart and life. And you can do that feeling safe. He's already forgiven you, by the way. But when we confess our sins, the Bible says that God, in 1 John, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So I invite you to take a moment to do that. And so, Lord, we want your power and we want your love to flow in us and through us. And so hear our confession. Wash away our iniquity, our sin, our selfishness. We confess our willful sins. Give us the desire to walk in your ways when we walk out of here. I pray that you would deliver us from guilt and shame And fill us with the love of Jesus Christ who set us free so that we could become all that you dream for us to become as men and women. Ordinary people who can live extraordinary lives because of who you are working in us and through us. In the name of Jesus. And everybody said.